Hey guys, welcome back. This is the second video about rhetorical analysis. In the last video, we covered the rhetorical situation and how to really break it down in terms of the types of uh, the types of rhetoric that there are, as well as the different kind of situational elements that there are. And by looking at those situational elements, then you can start to see how certain um, uh, decisions are made about the the function and formation of the language. Um, that's obviously something that needs more specific practice. These are these videos are more to just kind of either prepare you to do that or to review certain information that you need in order to do that. Um, so today what we're going to be covering are rhetorical appeals, uh, which build upon that rhetorical situation. Uh, as with the previous video, this is, uh, ref is going to reference certain material that we can find in our textbook, although I'll be putting in my own stuff uh, along the way. So let's get started. Um, so many of you probably in previous classes have learned about rhetorical appeals, ethos, logos, and pathos. Um, and I'm glad that you have, and I'm sure you hopefully have at least some grounding in what each of those stands for. Now, the tricky thing is that in other English classes, and I'm guilty of this myself um, from time to time, in other English classes, it'll often be oversimplified. Uh, so they'll all be kind of compartmentalized as ethos is its own thing, and logos is its own thing, and pathos is its own thing, and they all kind of operate separately. Um, but I think what we really need to think of is, is uh, we need to think of these as operating in unison all the time. And so it gets much more complex when we start to think about the rhetorical appeals as operating in unison. Uh, so uh, let's not let's start with not oversimplifying ethos, logos, and pathos as you know simply operating separately all the time. First of all, uh, so like I said, the old way of thinking about these is that they happen one at a time. So the author is doing ethos here or the author is appealing to pathos there or here is where the author's logos is and that's like i said it's the old way of thinking about it it's an easy way to introduce people to the concept of ethos pathos and logos because uh because you know thinking about all three at once uh, can be difficult however the complex way to think about these and the way that we need to start thinking about these is that each of them are happening all the time and affecting the other. So a simple um, a example that I can think of at this very moment, since this is all taking place during the coronavirus quarantine, is if you're looking at a graph of the pandemic, um, you know, that shows the number of cases rising exponentially over a course of days, then often what we're taught is that well that must be logos because it's numbers whereas in fact uh it's much more than that it may logically appeal to our sense of like you know if numbers keep going up then this is going to get really bad um and and we'll notice that however um there is also a sense of pathos there there's a sense of fear right there's a sense of uncertainty so the emotion that we feel uh, when we look at that graph is just as important as the logic behind it. The logic is actually contributing to the fear in this case because we see the logic going up, 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 right? Like if this continues, then we're all doomed. And that contributes to the sense of fear. Um, and then in terms of ethos, then there's also the authority of just being able to say, these are numbers that are coming out, right? Like we trust these numbers and the, the, the trust that we put in that actually uh, contributes also to the to the sense of fear. If we trust the numbers, we get more afraid. So they're all happening simultaneously. Um, and you can think of it as a spider's web, you know, like when you when you pull on one element of the spider's web, the other elements are also tugged in that direction. Uh, and that's how um, the rhetorical appeals really work. When you pull on one, the others are being affected. So think about it that way. Now, let's get a little bit more specific. Um, well, sorry about the, there's this note, like, let, 
you have to think holistically, right? Like you have to think about them all at the same time. You know, how is one appeal affecting the other appeals? So now let's get a little bit more specific. Um, let's talk about how each appeals to the audience differently. We'll start by just looking at the different ones, right? We know that ethos is ethos, uh, sorry, ethos is a sense of trust. It appeals to our senses of, um, you know, authority as well. So trust and authority uh, and shared values. Logos is a sense of logic. Uh, so it, uh, you know, that kind of linear thinking from from one place to another. And then pathos is an is appeal to um, the emotional side of things. Um, so if we want definitions and we can say ethos builds credibility and trustworthiness, uh, logos reveals the reasoning behind your ideas and pathos creates emotional responses to the material. Again, all of these, I'm separating them out here, but all of these, you should be thinking of how does one affect the other two? They always affect the other two. Even if one is dominant, Th then uh, that dominant appeal is going to kind of tug on the other two uh, in sometimes subtle and, and other times not so subtle ways. So we'll look a little bit at how ethos is built then. Um, we look to ethos uh, in terms of when, a, when uh, somebody using rhetoric is expressing shared values or experiences, when that person is relying on their reputation, uh, when they're relying on expertise um, to do that, whether that's their own expertise or drawing on the expertise of others, uh, that can that can be um, an appeal to ethos. And then finally, uh, there's a difference between automatic ethos and established ethos, where automatic ethos is you just have it because you have it right the president of the united states has automatic ethos because he's the president of the united states your teachers and your parents have automatic ethos over you because uh because of their reputation as parents and teachers whereas other people need to establish their ethos right like they need to show their expertise they need to build their reputation they need to establish that they share values with you that they share experiences with you before they are credible or trustworthy to you. When we move on to Logos, uh, it's all about how we reveal the reasoning behind our ideas, and we do that in a number of different ways. So first of all, we take um, Logos, often it can be broken down into a main idea and then specific details, and then the identification of connections between those ideas. So what i'm talking about is when you see a person saying this is my idea here's my evidence and here's why my evidence supports my idea that's a logical progression of thought and that is an appeal to logos because it you know it's very logically going from one step to the other uh, we can often break that down into if then therefore statements so anytime you see an if then therefore statement being used then you know that logic is being appealed to. You know, you're, we're taking uh, we're taking kind of this logical journey through a process, a, a, a thought process. Um, oftentimes, we find the logic of of the thought process in a thesis statement. Not always, obviously, um, or that's not the the only way that we find it. But if you're looking for what is the logic of a person's uh, appeal, uh, persuasive appeal then you'll often find it in their thesis statement. This is how I'm going to take you from this concept through to my conclusion, through to my ultimate purpose. Uh, we also appeal to logic through counter arguments. So being able to show that we have thought through the other side and can still make attempts at, uh, um, you know, counteracting those, um, that other side. Uh, we can do the same thing through concessions by recognizing that we can think logically through the other side's arguments and concede that maybe their argument in certain areas is much stronger and then being able to refute it as well. So whether we're conceding or refuting, it's showing our ability to look at the other side and understand the other side 
in a way that's going to logically convince somebody of hopefully of your point of view. You can see also how that might build ethos, right? If you're willing to concede or you're able to refute, that's building your reputation and elaborating upon your expertise, right? So uh, concessions can also show shared values when you're argue if you're arguing against somebody, then uh, and, and you know kind of giving them the upper hand kind of allows them to build trust. So there are elements of logos uh, that will play into ethos, obviously, uh, and vice versa. So then let's look at pathos. Um, uh, so this is where we're creating emotional responses to the material, to the subject. Um, and we do that in any number of ways. So remember that emotions, first of all, can be positive or negative, And each one of those can have this kind of visceral response, right? Like, like when you have, when you feel positively or you feel negatively, you're more likely to either you know, go along with something or rebel against that thing. So depending on what your purpose is, you're going to want to um, to uh, make use of decide, you know, whether you're going to use these positive or negative emotions. And then obviously positive or negative emotions can build ethos as well, because if you're making somebody feel positively towards you, you're building trust, uh, positive Emotions are often built off of shared values and shared experiences. Whereas if you're making somebody feel negatively towards you, you have to concede or negatively towards something else in that case. But if it's negative toward you, you have to concede that they're going, that you're going to lose some of that ethos. Whereas if you're making them feel negative toward another, you know, another side, then that may show shared values. So it's all very, you know, intertwined. Um, another way that we build pathos is through word connotations. So really thinking about specific how specific words are being used to evoke specific emotion. If I say that um, you know this person is um, sickly, uh, then there's this kind of uh, negative emotion uh, connotated with that, right? Like they they look they look bad, right? If you're saying they're sickly. But if you're describing the same person as looking thin, then that has positive emotions, right? That, you know, sickly, a sickly person may be thin, but if you're choosing to, to use the word thin in place of sickly, then instead of emphasizing the negativity of that, of the situation this person's in, you're actually uh, emphasizing the positivity. So connotations there can be really important. Images can also invoke emotions. So think about how uh, just the way something looks will make you feel. Um, and humor also is a very um, a very uh, useful way to use emotions. Again, can be used positively or negatively to evoke positive or negative emotions about yourself or about uh, your subject or whatever it is. But humor can be a very effective way to appeal emotionally. The warning that I want to give you is uh, that of polemics. Um, so this is a very common thing that people will do. They will make primarily emotional arguments and primarily emotional arguments are weak. We call them polemic, polemical arguments. They may be effective, but they're weak. And there's a difference between effectiveness and weakness. So anytime you're making appeals to emotions or you're noticing appeals to emotions in somebody else's rhetoric, you want to look for, well, are they possibly covering up for some weakness in other areas of their persuasion? Um, you know, are they covering up for a lack of credibility? Are they covering up for a lack of, of logic? you know, look for those kinds of things. I want to leave you with one last thought that some of you may have been rolling around in your mind, and that is to return to Logos for just a second. Um, we have often been taught that Logos is just a presentation about numbers and graphs. So anytime there's a number or graph on a piece of paper, that's logic. And I think that's way, way, way oversimplified. You have to stop thinking about it that way if you've thought about it that way before. And if you haven't, then don't start thinking about it that way. Numbers are equally emotional and ethical. 
Um, just because there's a number on a page doesn't automatically make it logical either. So with the example that I gave with the coronavirus numbers, you know, I showed you how those numbers could be an appeal to logic, but also have a pathological and an ethical side to them. And I think it's really important to know that sometimes a person is going to use a number primarily emotionally to get your hackles up, to really kind of worry or, or to make you feel good or, or whatever. Um, and it's not going to necessarily be used logically. So never, ever, ever make the mistake of thinking just because there's a number presented, then it's a logical, it's, it's an appeal to logic. It may be exactly the opposite, actually. All right, so with all of that information, you have the basic groundwork for how to, how to do a rhetorical analysis. The question is then, how do we apply all of that? And that, of course, is what we would work on in class.